Hi, I'm Heather. And this is Jax. Welcome to Ask AI. Ask AI is a podcast dedicated to artificial intelligence. Finding out what artificial intelligence even means. We're going to learn as we go. Let's talk AI. Today we have with us Benjamin Allery. Ben is one of the most remarkable legal minds in Canada, North America, and the world. Ben, so great to have you with us. You've had an incredible career thus far. You have degrees from the University of Toronto and Yale, and an associate professor of law and chair of business law at the University of Toronto, and are also the CEO and co-founder of Blue Jay Legal, a machine learning company focused on legal research. Wow. Ben, what has driven your career thus far? Uh, well, that's a, a really flattering introduction. Thanks, Jackson. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, what has driven my career thus far is really a curiosity into the operating system of society. So how does, how does a legal system interact with and influence how people make decisions? That's really my primary interest. It's a curiosity that's, that's really driven me to all of my, all of my academic research uh, is driven by this curiosity. And now uh, my work at Blue Jay Legal is also driven by the same curiosity. Oh, that's incredible. Um, I think it's such an interesting part of the legal profession that you do have the chance to explore so deeply to debate these different topics and these, you know, really, really things at the core of society. Um, I can definitely see how that's been a driving theme or a driving principle of, of why you are where you are there. The other big question I wanted to ask you is, you know, what do you think is changing right now in the world of law? I feel like you've maybe proceeded in your career and grown through it at probably the most transformational time in, in legal history, given the impacts of technology, the massive increase in the population of society. I mean, overall, uh, we've seen a real emergence over the last sort of millennium, um, the last couple of decades, and I feel like you've been in the, uh, right in the heart of that. Yeah, so I think we're at an, a major, major inflection point in how we govern ourselves, and I think this inflection point is going to rival in influence and, and maybe even surpass in influence one of the earlier inflection points, which I would trace back to the middle of the 1400s in Europe and the printing press. And so at that point, we saw published books become uh, really quite commonplace. And that allowed for the propagation of legal information uh, at a much faster pace right across uh, Europe and eventually throughout the world, and this this is actually a major major change. And if you if you look back at history through the lens of what did the book, the bound book with movable type, how did that actually influence things? I think it had a major profound influence on the subsequent centuries. I think moving from oral traditions of law or monarchical traditions of law or uh, religious conceptions of law, which is what really predated uh, movable type in the printing press. And then you introduce the printing press and you see major, major changes. And the ramifications really took several centuries to play out, right? And you look at the Protestant Reformation or you look at the French Revolution, you look at subsequent scientific discovery and developments. This took centuries to play out. I think now we're seeing this move from books to what I would call computational law. And so now we're seeing books give way to digitized information, but it's not just digitized information. We're now going to see the legal system actually become animated and dynamic through code and provide uh, much faster guidance to individuals and organizations and to governments about what's permissible, what's impermissible, according to the rules that we set for each other and for ourselves collectively. And, and this, the medium is going to be computing. And so AI is a big piece of this. I would throw blockchain into the mix and say blockchain is probably going to be a part of this story going forward in the legal system. And it's going to have profound ramifications, most of which are very, very difficult for us to foresee at this point, just in the same way that, you know, when the printing press was introduced and the first millions of volumes were being pumped out of printing presses in Europe, nobody foresaw what would actually ultimately happen out of that. So it, it is, you're quite right. This is a very, very exciting time to be involved in, in the legal system and legal education and also in the entrepreneurial space dealing with the law. I can't wait to see all the different 
different changes that are going to happen. I think, I mean, it's such a possibility that, you know, fairness could certainly be increased. I mean, the very way that we govern um, is going to change so dramatically. Of course, this is the Ask AI podcast, um, and you are a co-founder of, you know, a machine learning and AI-focused company, um, Blue Jay Legal. I did want to particularly dive into how you think AI is chained in the space of law. And, you know, I'm excited to dive in, um, but I'd love to talk about, you know, how is that entering the space of law and how is it really being perceived in law, the entrance of AI? Oh, so this is a huge topic. I think, I think there are different perspectives on it. Uh, and I think if you talk to lawyers, you talk to different people in the legal system from a highly stylized perspective, you could say there are kind of two camps of people. One camp would be characterized as saying, oh, this is all hype. This is nothing but hype. It's hype, 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 hype. And there's some truth to that reaction in the sense that if you go back to the law reviews and you look in the late 60s, you look at the early 70s, there's a lot of talk about, look, AI is going to totally change the law. These systems are going to dramatically affect how the legal system operates and computers are going to take over law firms and hand-wringing about you know, what's going to happen to lawyers in the future. Now, fast forward 50 years, right? And here we are in 2018. And a lot of those lawyers would say, well, I started my career and there were law review articles around computers displacing lawyers, changing fundamentally how how law is practiced and how the legal system operates. And I've been hearing about this for my entire career and things haven't changed that fundamentally in that whole time. So the hypesters will say like, this is, this is actually just hype. The other side of it is, well, those folks who are saying it's all hype, the flip side is those people who are saying, actually, I'm really scared because it could just be hype until it's no longer hype and then it's actually right. So it could just be, yes, it takes a while for things to actually happen, especially if you're dealing with change that is exponential in nature. And so all of your listeners are going to be familiar with Moore's Law and the exponential increase in computing power over time. And So it could just be that those law review articles in the 1960s, 1970s were prophetic. They weren't wrong, but it's just taking a while for their predictions to actually come to fruition. And so the folks who are scared are saying, well, I I, I can see now and I'm starting to see as an entrepreneur what's possible using this technology. And we are at the early stages of machine learning and AI in law, but we're already at a point where we're able to predict uh, in many cases with better than 90% accuracy how new cases are going to be decided by the courts. That's actually an astonishing new power that lawyers have at their disposal that they haven't had in the past. So using conventional statistics, summary statistics, ordinary, you know, least squares, regression methodologies, you wouldn't be able to do this. But with new machine learning algorithms, you're able to make much better predictions based on all kinds of interdependencies that are latent in the case law. And so what we're going to see is a, a massive increase in the speed of the development of the common law. And it's, it's very, very exciting. And so the second camp of people are those who are scared about this and saying, well, if, if as a lawyer, clients come to me for my sage advice, for my learned advice about how courts are going to decide new fact situations, then aren't I going to be wrong footed by these algorithms, these systems that are able to predict better than I'm able to predict what a court is likely to do? And I think there the answer is, well, yes and no. I mean, these are tools. These are tools that you can leverage. They're highly complementary to the sorts of abilities that human lawyers have. So humans think about things in a different way than machine learning algorithms. And you can increase the power of the predictability of these systems by complementing them with someone, an individual, a human who actually is able to anticipate where things are going to go better than algorithms. And so humans are actually judging these cases. And so we're trying to predict a human process. So humans are, human lawyers are going to have more insight in some ways into what judges are likely to do in new cases, drawing on much broader sets of information about what's happening in society, what the political currents are like economically, what the the situation is like. For now, these machine learning algorithms are looking at the case law and treating judgments as data, able to do pretty profound things with that information. But for now, these machines are a very strong complement. They can't replace, they will not replace 
human lawyers. And I think what you'll see are human lawyers actually working with these systems, leveraging these systems in very, very interesting ways. And so lawyers are very clever and the best lawyers are going to be able to leverage these tools to find novel arguments, to help the law develop, to get get us to a point where the law is is in uh, what John Rawls, the philosopher, would call uh, reflective equilibrium, uh, and something that I've written about in my academic work, which I would call the legal singularity, where things are actually, uh, you reach a more or less stable equilibrium where the law is normatively uh, and positively kind of fleshed out. And so you could actually rely on uh, what these machine learning algorithms are telling you, or AI systems are going to be telling you about what your legal obligations are, what your rights are. And legal uncertainty will be a thing mostly relegated to the past. And people will look back and marvel, how is it that you actually dealt with all of that uncertainty? How did you, like, you woke up in the morning and you you didn't, you, know, you weren't sure, you know, if what you were doing was negligent or not. You You had no easy way of figuring out what you were entitled to. Uh, and what you what your obligations were vis-a-vis everyone else, uh, and because it'll just become fairly obvious what your your obligations are with respect to to various others, and it's a kind of a vision for the future that I think still is difficult for even for me, and I, I, I suspect for virtually all of your listeners to to wrap their heads around. But I, I think we're headed in that direction. It's going to take some time. It's going to take more technological breakthroughs, but I I think we're going to get there. Wow. A lot to take in. So part of your background is in tax law. I guess to kind of drill down a little bit more, can you speak to how you feel like taxation and specifically taxation law will change, providing perhaps some specific examples for our listeners to hold on to? Yeah, for sure. So I think one of the things that characterizes how a lot of people feel this time of the year, today it's, you know, it's April, it's tax season, and a lot of people are confronting uh, their tax returns. I'm, I'm mostly kind of deferring mine until the very last moment. And so, uh, you know, I'll get to it sometime in the next couple of weeks and, and file. But I, I think one of the things that's concerning to people is we have a self-assessment tax system. So everyone is assumed to know what their tax obligations are. They're assumed to know really fundamental things about how they're structuring their relationships with the state and with each other. So to give you a, a really fresh example and a, a current example, there's been a class action lawsuit filed against Uber relating to the characterization of their workers as independent contractors. And so this is this is for employment law purposes. So the class action is on behalf of workers who say, actually, Uber, you're saying that we are independent contractors, but in fact, we're really employees. And so we're entitled to a, a number of different protections that are uh, afforded to workers as employees that independent contractors aren't required to be given by parties that retain them, right? So here the basic distinction is, well, if you have an employer-employee relationship, employees are understood by the law to potentially be in a subordinate position with respect to the employer, and that position may be abused by employers, and so employees are protected by the law in certain ways. They're entitled to a certain number of breaks. They are entitled to overtime pay if they work in a certain capacity and if they work for long enough and and all sorts of different protections. For tax purposes, that really matters because employees have tax withholding at source and CPP and EI contributions are made on their behalf by the employer. And, you know, they have also their own CPP and EI contributions withheld from their pay. And so these issues also arise for worker classification in the tax system. And so these things come up all the time. There are hundreds and hundreds of cases where employees slash independent contractors have been challenged. And sometimes the challenges are the tax authorities coming and saying, oh, workers, you're actually employees. And so therefore you owe us a whole bunch of additional tax. You you should have had tax withheld from your paychecks. And so employees, you owe us a lot more money for tax purposes. And you also owe us these payroll taxes, CPP, EI contributions, and employers, you also owe us the same thing. Uh, so Sometimes there are individual workers who say, I know I filed my tax returns as an independent contractor, but really I was an employee, which means now that I'm out of work, I should be able to get the benefit of employment insurance. So now I'm filing retrospectively for employment insurance and I want employment insurance. I don't know. I just signed whatever documents this party who was hiring me told me to sign. 
sign. I signed off on it. I didn't realize what the implications were for that. And so that's just one example of a question that the law has tons of guidance in the case law. So you can actually reverse engineer what drives the courts to say a worker is either an employer or an independent contractor. And we've built this functionality and you can get a really, really strong prediction of what the court would do in a new case. So 90% or better accuracy coming out of out of our system with respect to that classification. But of course, that's just one really common example of the ways in which you can use new technology to reduce uncertainty in the tax system. And so all of the big four accounting firms are using our software now to figure out different tax situations, including questions around income versus capital. Um, yeah, there are lots of things. I, I could go into it, but I, I, I suspect most of your listeners are not going to be tax experts and aren't going to get a whole lot of value out of those different examples. But what I'll say is it's a way to reduce uncertainty in the tax system, which gives the government greater confidence that, that when they're auditing people, they're going after the right people for the right sorts of things. And it gives taxpayers and their advisors a roadmap about how to comply with the law so they can know precisely up front what to do. Uh, in order to comply with the law. And so it's going to be reducing uncertainty in the tax system, which I think everyone can agree is a good thing. Well, let's let's make the tax <laughs> yes. system more predictable, uh, more certain, and more fair. That would probably be a great segue for you to talk a little bit about your company. Can you tell us about what Blue Jay Legal does? Yeah, sure. So what Blue Jay Legal does is we basically treat judgments as data, and we train machine learning algorithms on court judgments on statutory materials, on regulations, and essentially provide lawyers and accountants and other professionals with the tools that they need to go deeper than they've ever been able to go before into the law. So traditionally at law school, and I suspect in accounting, it's it's quite similar. When you encounter gray areas, when you encounter areas where it's difficult to come up with definitive answer, you end up doing a fairly informal analysis where you catalog some of the reasons on one side, some of the reasons that something might go the other way. And then you're you're left with a two-handed analysis on the one hand, on the other hand. And then you can't really get closure in that situation. It's just very difficult. And in a lot of these adversarial circumstances, one side will highlight all of the reasons in their favor, and the other side will highlight all the reasons in their favor on the other side. And it's really hard to get closure in those circumstances, which is why you see the, like pockets of litigation around these areas where there's a lot of uncertainty. That's the law trying to work itself to certainty. And so we can use all of that litigation, all of those judgments in those areas as fodder for training machine learning algorithms, we can actually predict how courts are going to decide in those areas. So it's a way of, of drawing together, kind of suturing the wounds in the common law, if you want to think about it that way, getting closure um, and allowing, allowing the law to actually become more predictable uh, and more fair. So that's a, a, at a theoretical level, practically speaking, companies, accounting firms, law firms, the government can sign up to tax foresight or employment foresight. And it's a, it's software as a service. So it's a subscription service. They sign up and the full suite of functions are available to those subscribers to run different reports, run different classifications of new cases or new situations that they're encountering and find out what it, what a court would likely do if, if those situations were actually to go before a court. So it's a way in 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes a little bit faster for an accountant or a lawyer or an auditor to get to a really high level of accuracy, a really high level of certainty around what would in the past have been a very kind of inchoate or difficult to predict area, a, a very difficult prediction. And then the, it, it's a departure point for going deeper if they want to. So then they can explore all the cases that match the facts of their situation. They can drill down kind of indefinitely, but it's a way to target their research efforts at precisely those authorities that are uh, most valuable in resolving that uncertainty. It's remarkable, Ben. Any advice for aspiring lawyers who are listening to the podcast or current lawyers? worrying about how artificial intelligence yeah. might affect them in their careers? Right. So my one piece of advice to aspiring lawyers, actually my advice, my advice applies to, to both camps. So both the hypesters and also to those who are really worried, I think is I would encourage people to be open to what's happening. Cause I think the greatest risk is actually closing your mind off and, and either saying, okay, I believe that this technology is not going to affect the practice of law. And then 
being made redundant or not actually tooling up as the tools become available. I think that's a big risk for those who want to, who are fond of dismissing this as all being hype. I think on the flip side, those who are worried should also be open to the ways in which they can add value to this technology because this technology is not self-executing. This requires people to be able to understand how to wield these tools. Just like a carpenter is going to wield power tools more or less well, carpentry didn't end with the hammer and the handsaw, right? And so the very most able carpenters have adapted their craft as tools have improved, techniques have improved. And lawyers do a lot of continuing professional development. Continuing legal education is very much part of the ethos for lawyers. And the same thing for accounting. There are all kinds of professional development opportunities. And so I think what I would do is encourage young lawyers, young accountants, young aspiring professionals, and even even those who are getting a little bit longer in the tooth to explore how they can use these tools through various ongoing learning opportunities. Because no question, this is where these practice areas are going. And so I really, I think that's the number one piece of advice. Stay open, keep your head up, keep your stick on the ice and stay alert. Thank you so much, Ben. It's clear that not only are you a phenomenal entrepreneur, but you're also obviously a great professor because that was an incredible, incredible interview. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Jackson. This episode's associate producer was Francesca Awotundun. Senior producer was Mike Letourneau, and executive producer was Chris McClellan. Interview recorded by Robin Edgar. Ask AI includes this podcast, a helpful chatbot, and live events. For more information, please visit our website at askai.org. Do you have questions about artificial intelligence and workplace automation? We'd love to help answer them. Send your queries to podcast at askai.org or tweet to askai.org.